before I begin my talk, I want you to see a wonderful video that was put together by BioVisions. It's about what goes on inside a single cell. So here it is. Some of you may have seen it. I'm not going to start right at the beginning. I'm just going to let it run. There's some sound with it, but it's just boring music, so we don't need to worry about that. Oh, let me put this on uh, the full screen. Yes, this is the sort of thing that goes on in the cells of your body. Little highways are built on which those trucks go. Uh, and it really, it is like this. This is, this is, this is accurate science. Actually, I, I've talked to cell biologists who say, well, it's accurate enough, it really is, except that it's not as complicated as the actual cells are. This is an oversimplified version of what's going on inside a cell. There was a restriction enzyme. Here we are building little tubulin highways. They build and unbuild all the time. That's, that's how cells move. That's how amoebas move. Oh, and here comes a motor protein. Look at that. This little guy's walking along, carrying things. There's trillions of these in your body. Marching along, they carry things around inside the cell. Maybe, maybe that's enough of this. I think it goes on and on. I showed you the motor protein, one of my all-time favorites. There's a, I think a ribosome doing its work. So I'm going to stop this now and switch to my talk. The evolution of reasons. There's Charles Darwin. We're celebrating Darwin Day. People, yes. <laughs> Laugh. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why they do that. There's really no real similarity. Or actually, I suppose there is, but it's it's an accident. Actually, I was actually setting out to look like Rasputin. <laughs> and uh, I just got older. So back to Darwin. What did Darwin show? Well, another guy with a beard, Karl Marx, has a wonderful thing that he says about Darwin. He says, not only is a death blow dealt here for the first time to teleology in the natural sciences, but their rational meaning is empirically explained. Marx was an admirer of Darwin, for sure. So what's teleology? It goes back to Aristotle. Yes, I'm a philosopher. And you're actually going to get some philosophy tonight. <laughs> this is often translated as causes, the idea. There's four causes, according to Aristotle. There's the material cause. That's sort of what a thing is made of. There's the formal cause, that's sort of what its shape is, what its form is. There's the efficient cause, that's what we normally mean by cause. It's the, the trigger that gets something moving. It's the event that initiates something. And then there's the final or telos or telic cause, that's the root of the word teleology. And this is the answer to the question why, what is this for? What is its, as the French say, its raison d'etre? What's the reason why it exists? So that's, teleology is about raison d'etre. Now, did Darwin find a safe place for teleology in science? Or did he show that, strictly speaking, there is no teleology, no purpose in the material world? This is still a controversy. And people in the sciences have different attitudes towards this. And I'm trying to illuminate this controversy and get it, if possible, to go away. Sometimes it's put this way, does natural selection reduce talic causes to efficient and formal causes? I'm going to say yes and no. I'm going for an understanding of what's really going on here. So here, uh, I didn't used to do this, but my wife says, it's good if you have an outline for your talk, then people know where you are in the talk. 
So here's what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to describe two different species of why questions, summarize as what for and how come. Then I'm going to talk about Darwin's contribution, which is the evolution from how come to what for. Then I'm going to talk about how we, we human beings, are the only reason representers. And then, this is a little jargon, it'll be clear at the end, I hope. I'm going to talk about something I call the intentional stance and show its use both in our everyday manifest image, the world we all live in, and in the scientific image in the world of science. So, we start with the part one. Two species of why questions, what for and how come. This is ambiguous in English. The word why is ambiguous. In a way it isn't in some other languages. Here's one way. Why does ice float? That's the how come sense of why. Why are you handing me your camera is the what for sense. It's asking for a purpose. The ice question isn't asking for a purpose. Now some questions are apparently ambiguous. Why are you drumming your fingers uh, to attract your attention? Hey, look what I found. That shows, that gives a what for answer. No reason, just a nervous twitch, that gives a how come answer. There's a process that explains my drumming my fingers, but I didn't have, there was no purpose, there was no reason for it. But how about this question? Why do pigeons bob their heads? Well, it turns out that there's a what for answer to that. And you may be able to figure out to a first approximation what it is. Pigeons, you know, have no binocular overlap. Most birds don't. Birds are prey. That is, their eyes, like the eyes of a horse or a, or a whale, are on the side of their heads. So how are they going to get depth perception? Only by motion parallax. So by bobbing their heads, they get two different views and they can get better depth perception. That's what it's for. So you see there is a what for, for the pigeons bobbing their heads. Compare that with this question. Why are planets spherical? And why aren't asteroids spherical? The answer is pretty clear. It's not that planets are spherical in order that they, you know, can roll downhill better or something like that. <laughs> it's simply a question of their mass and gravity and uh, what gravity does as mass increases and minimizes the uh, area of the, of the, of the surface of a, of, a, of a mass. Now the how come questions have answers which I'm going to call process narratives. They say, well this happens and then that happens and this happens and it's all explained of course in terms of, of laws of nature typically. There's no suggestion of any justification. Consider the question, why does ice float? Now, it could be taken for a what for question. I don't advise it. I mean, the interesting question is, what is it about the way H2O crystallizes that makes the resulting solid uh, less dense than the liquid in which it then floats? That's perfectly good what for question. But you could, if you were of the mind to, turn it into a what for question, saying, what, what's the purpose of ice floating? And this would be a what for question, and it would presumably, what you'd be asking for would be God's reasons for making ice flow. And of course there are some creationists who, who want to look at things like that in that way. God, God made, made ice to float so that fish could live through the winter at the bottom of the pond, so that uh, you know, uh, human beings could have lots of fish in the middle of the winter, something like that, or you know, make up your own story. <laughs> Okay. I think the difference between how come and what for should be obvious, but I'm going to make it extra vivid with an example from my own uh, checkered past. I once went 
to Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, which some of you may know is or was back then, the, was to Skinnerian behaviorism what the Vatican is to Roman Catholicism. And I had a debate there with an ardent Skinnerian, Lou Michaels, the chairman of the um, psychology department. And this went on, it was an even bigger audience than this, and it went on for a long time. And after the formal papers, the discussion went back and forth and back and forth between us. And at one point, now this was back in 1974, a long time ago, and at one point I turned to Lou and I said, but why, Lou, do you say that? He just uttered a particularly ripe bit of Skinnerian dogma. And without skipping a beat, he replied, because I've been reinforced for saying that in the past. <laughs> now, he was taking my what for question and turning it into a process narrative how come question. And in fact, if you think about it, you realize that that was one of the big problems with Skinnerian behaviorism. They were trying to get rid of all the what for questions and replace them with, with how come questions. And sometimes what you want is an answer to a what for question. And he was not providing it. So, you've seen the difference between how come and what for. Now, I'm sorry I have to taxonomize a little bit more and say there's also two subspecies of what for. What for is always about what ought to be, about what is good in one way or another. And two different schools of thought have emerged from philosophy about this. And I'm going to call them Pittsburgh normativity, after the Pittsburgh philosophy department, where this uh, movement thrives particularly. And what I'm going to call consumer reports <coughs> normativity. No university there. What's the difference between them? Well, normativity, of course, is just this oughtness, this about what is good, what must happen, or what should happen. Wherever there's normativity, there has to be some sort of corrective force or process to maintain it. Norms need a process of correction or enforcement. And according to the Pittsburgh School, this is social correction. This is, this is punishment or, sen or what, what John Hoagland, the late John Hoagland, called censoriousness. It's that's, that's the sort of correction of Pittsburgh normativity. Bob Brandom, following Wilfred Sellers, talks about the space of reasons and says, we human beings engage in this activity of trading reasons. You know, I ask you, why are you doing that? And you tell me, and I say, but that's not a good reason. And back and forth it goes, this demanding and giving reasons. And that's the birth for the Pittsburgh crowd. This is, this is the home of reasons in this space of reasons that arise where people are asked to justify their own, their own conduct, basically. Reasons for actions. Justifying oneself. So just keep that in mind. As it's the game of justifying yourself and the game of asking for and giving reasons. That's Pittsburgh normativity. Consumer reports normativity, on the other hand, is concerned with the norms of good design or good value. And the process that corrects that norm, to that norm, are things like quality control and market forces and what Consumer Reports does and what Evolution does. Evolution does Consumer Reports correction. So here's a nice vivid way of remembering the difference between Pittsburgh and Evolution as, as normativity. It's the difference between naughty and stupid. <laughs> People may punish you for being naughty. Evolution punishes you for being stupid, <laughs> badly designed. So now I'm almost finished with this taxonomy of why. The, the, the English word why goes into two forms, how come and what for. And then what for goes into two forms, Pittsburgh normativity and evolutionary normativity. They're both subspecies of what for, and hence both subspecies of the why of teleology, which is the what for sense. And both presuppose a kind of justification. 
They both ask in their different ways, why is this a good thing? A good thing, well, a good deed, or maybe a good tool, a good weapon. There's no moral justification in the uh, evolutionary case at all. Okay. Back to the how come sense of why process narrative sense does not imply, as I've said, or does it presuppose any sort of justification. It just tells the story of the physical process that brought about this result. Let me give you a few examples of how come why. Failure analyses. Why did the turbine blade snap? Certainly not asking a what for question. Why did this building collapse? Almost never asking a what for question. Or historical explanations. There's a nice book by Ian Morris. I recommend Why the West Rules for Now. The why in that is a how come question, not a what for. It's important, I think, to make the distinction. So, how come is great for natural saliencies? Why is the sky blue? Or consider this. Why does sand form those ripples? Or, what about these strange forms in Cappadocia, so-called fairy chimneys? Other names occur to me. <laughs> I visited Cappadocia back during Clinton's presidency, and I thought that on the right that was should be called the President Clinton Park. <laughs> but now look at these. These look very similar, but the one on the left has a what for explanation, and the one on the right doesn't. The one on the left is a sculpture by Andy Goldsworthy. Now there is a, a how come too. You, if you want to know how he made it, it's an interesting question, and there's a good answer. But if you want to know why he made it, it, it was made on purpose. It's a work of art. The one on the right looks as if it was made by people, for sure, but it isn't. This was a cover picture in Science a few years back. It's the result of freezing and thawing in the Arctic, which has an amazing result of forming those structures. Okay, so that's so much for the first question. We're now ready for the second question, where I'm going to try to explain to you how Darwin moves us from how come to what for. So here's Darwin. <laughs> In Darwin's dangerous idea, I put forward the idea that what Darwin discovered, this is anachronistic to put it this way because he didn't have the terms to use it, was that natural selection is actually an algorithmic process. Now you know what algorithms are. They're things like, well, long division is an al uh, algorithm, putting things in alphabetical order is an algorithm. It is an information handling process which uh, accomplishes a certain task. There's sorting algorithms, there's generate and test algorithms. And also, of course, we use randomness in algorithms. There's nothing that prevents you from using randomness in algorithms. In fact, a lot of them do, starting, let's say, with law and division. You want to know whether 478 goes into 27,904, and you've got to put a number up there and multiply it out to see if you've got the right first digit, which number should you choose? Choose one at random, if you like. If it's too small, you can increment it. If it's too big, you can decrement it. You'll get the answer right anyway. You don't have to guess right. You can guess at random if you like. That's the use of randomness in an algorithm. Now, I want to use this idea of evolution as an algorithmic process to address a question that we heard about from P.Z. Myers when he was talking about Stephen Myers, different Meyer altogether, different spelling, uh, signature in the cell. Now, you're conspecific, but that's about it. <laughs> um, 
how does evolution by natural selection get started? The problem of the origin of life itself. And as you surely know, this is an unsolved problem. We don't know yet. And it's a favorite of intelligent design people and creationists because they think it's an insoluble problem. But as usual, it's because they're making it look too hard from the outset. I want to try to shed a little light on that by looking at the algorithmic nature, not just of natural selection, of reproducing life forms, but of the algorithmic nature of prebiotic, before there was any life processes. I want to point out the importance of cycles in abiotic nature. Abiotic meaning having nothing to do with biology. Independently, more, more fundamental, just physical. Well, there's the seasons. The cycle of the seasons. That's, that's a cycle which repeats year after year after year. There's night and day that repeats every 24 hours. There are the tides. They have a different a double cycle, both spring tides and neap tides, and then you have your, your every 12 hours, roughly, uh, low tides and high tides. Then there's the water cycle that we all learned about in grade school, where the water evaporates, goes up into the clouds, then, then rains back down and fills the rivers, and round and round the water goes. And that's a cycle which is uh, uh, of completely variable uh, uh, temporal dimensions. Then, at a different temporal and, and physical scale, there's thousands and thousands of chemical cycles that have been discovered by chemists. And these go along churning away round and round, different speeds, some going very slow, some going so fast you can hardly see them. And they've been going around prebiotically for a billion years, give or take, before there was any life on the planet. Think of cycles as do loops. If you're a programmer, you will know immediately what I mean. A do loop in a program, is a, in an algorithm, is, a, is something which you start it and you just keep doing it until some condition is met, then something else happens. Most programs are do loops within do loops within do loops of one sort or another. The important thing about cycles is that they return to a starting point after accomplishing something. I put that in scare quotes. They do something, and then they return to a starting state, and then they do it again, and again, and again. Maybe they're accumulating something. Maybe they're moving something. Maybe they're sorting something. Maybe they're eroding something. The importance of cycles in human artifacts is, I think, extremely, extremely interesting. Let me give you a simple example. The first one of our ancestors to take a bit of rough stone and a stick and just rub that stick back and forth on that stone all day long, back and forth. You look at it, you can't see any difference between any two cycles. By the end of the day, he's got a really straight arrow shaft. The gradual increment of imperceptible one at a time changes, gradually produces something that could only be produced by such a cycle. Cycles, do loops of this sort, change the conditions in the world and this raises the probability that something new will happen. All of this prebiotically. This there's a much better way of thinking about prebiotic conditions on this planet than the 
It's just a confetti of random chemicals way that we are encouraged by, by creationists to think about prebiotic nature. It isn't just complete randomness. There's all sorts of processes that are building things and then tearing them apart, and then building them and tearing them apart, and building them and tearing them apart. But this keeps changing the conditions and changing the coincidence of different conditions over time. And if you've got a billion years to do it, processes that might, and conditions that might otherwise be very unlikely, might every now and then, once in a few billion years, once in a few million years, they might occur. This is an example that's uncontroversial now. This is the paper that it's taken from by Kessler and Werner, and they talk about the different species of sorted ground. Notice this is not biological, this is just the cycle of freezing and thawing in the Arctic that do, does this, and in other parts of the world. And what it does is it creates feedback processes, and it gradually, inexorably sorts the stones by size and weight in the following way, and creates the patterns. And if you wonder whether it would actually work, they actually have a nice little simulation, a nice little algorithm that shows the process in action. These are taken from that. Nice perspective shifting article. So what we can see is gradually growing algorithmicity. And this is happening all over, wherever it can, parallel processing, many instances of the process happening at once, here and there. We might call that mass production. And what I want to suggest, we don't know the details yet, is it gradually turns into mass reproduction. And once we get reproduction, of course, then evolution really takes off. We're moving here from differential persistence to differential reproduction. A diamond is very persistent. That gives it a much longer time to pick up coatings of one thing or another, or scratches or whatever, than things that are going to fall apart very fast. But a diamond never has any progeny. We can talk, is the Monday's diamond, becomes Tuesday's diamond, becomes Wednesday's diamond, Thursday, Friday, lots of days. That's differential persistence, but there's still only one of them. Once you start multiplying, changes everything, and the process becomes more effective, as one says, geometrically. Introduce another term from hacking, from computer science, clobbering. Clobbering is when one subroutine, one bit of algorithm, inadvertently undoes or interferes with the result of another algorithm and clobbers it. And programmers know that clobbering is, is a problem. How do you keep one process from clobbering another process? You isolate them in one way or another so that they can't interfere with each other. That's one of the tricks of the trade. Serendipity is just the opposite of clobbering. It's when one process interferes with another and it helps in an inadvertent way. Well now, how could we account for both serendipity and clobbering prevention in the prebiotic world? Well, with a membrane. Membranes happen to be wonderful clobbering preventers. They just isolate one set of chemical cycles from other chemical cycles so that they won't get clobbered inadvertently by whatever happens along. Little insulation in effect. This permits those do loops to operate without interference. And there's the Krebs cycle and thousands of other cycles that have now been well studied by cell biologists and uh, 
uh, molecular biologists, biochemists. And biochemical cycles are the nervous system of single cells. And you saw some of that, just some of that, in that wonderful animation that I showed at the outset. If you want to read a really lovely book on this, read Dennis Bray's book, Wetware, which is all about chemical networks within individual cells and the way they play the role of a nervous system for amoebas and other, and, and bacteria too, for that matter. Persistence gives things extra time to pick up revisions and adjustments, and reproduction is then just a special kind of persistence. The persistence that heightens itself by creating extra tokens of types, by making duplicates, spreading out over the terrain a bunch of very similar things, which can, in parallel, explore different corners of the world. And if any one of them happens to find particularly salubrious conditions, and if it can then make more of its own in those conditions, then we're off to the races. We know the folk theorem, don't put all your eggs in one basket. This is, you might say, the first axiom of population thinking, and it does play an important role in evolution. Now we're ready for from how come to what for. I want you to imagine that we get in a time machine and we go back to the prebiotic era when there isn't yet demonstrably reproducing life forms, but there's all these cyclical processes going on. As these cyclical processes continue, the focus shifts. Some features are becoming ubiquitous. Hey, there's another one of those, and another, and another. And we can ask, why are we seeing these things? And now the question is ambiguous. Because on the one hand, there is a process narrative. Well, there's this process. I've been sort of sketching out a very crude version of it for you here. But there's also a justification. Now, recently several people have written very well, I think, about what they call Darwinism about Darwinism. That is, you want to recognize that the basic idea that there aren't any sharp, sharp lines uh, between species, for instance, carries around to other issues in Darwinism, too. And in particular, to the idea of how do we get from how come, I mean, from, yeah, from how come to what for. The process is gradual. There's no magic moment when suddenly it's all been how come up to now, and then shazam, boom, now it's what for. No, it's just that talking about what for becomes more and more appropriate. It becomes more and more insight generating to think about asking the second why question, not just the first. We can always ask the what for, the how come question. We can ask that about everything that happens in your brain. We can ask it about everything that happens in the stock market. But the question is, when are we licensed to start asking the what for question, the question of teleology? Here's what happens at that period of transition. Physically possible, chemically possible alternatives are just absent. They're not there on the scene anymore. Instead, we see a subset of the possible. What we're seeing are things that are better at persisting, at reproducing in the local circumstances than the alternatives. They're better at that, and that's why we see them. We're witnessing an automatic pairing away of the non-functional, if the function you're interested in is reproducing. Tibor Ganti should be better known, a very interesting, actually an engineer, Hungarian, who came up with this wonderful simplification, this schematic simplification of the simplest living thing, which he called the chematon. And you'll see that it has three main components. It has a membrane and a membrane forming process or system. That's to prevent clobbering. It has a genetic system, that's so that it can reproduce. And it has a metabolic system, that's so it can capture energy. And how these interact is what his 
uh, elegant work is about. It vastly oversimplifies what we find in every living cell. Once we get to a reproducing bacterium, there is a bounty of functional virtuosity. We saw a fraction of that in that animation. All those little machines, very efficient, sometimes provably orders of magnitude more efficient than alternatives. In other words, there are reasons why the parts are shaped and ordered as they are. They're shaped this way rather than that way because this way is better at sustaining the self-reproduction which is now the requirement for being here in the first place. And we can reverse engineer any reproducing entity determining it's good and it's bad. And why it is good and bad. Why is it better for the chemicals to be arranged this way than some other way? This is a question that can have an answer and a quite clear and provable answer. Okay. So I'm pushing this view of reasons even at the bacterial level. And some biologists I know are going to say, oh, come on, really? And they're going to say, this isn't real design. This is only apparent design. And PZ had that wonderful slide of the Shelley quote, which I love. I've got to get that slide from you because I want to talk about it myself. But I also think that it's this uh, element of major misdirection in that, which I'm now going to try to expose. Now, Richard Dawkins has publicly decried talking about the design of biological phenomena. He says, in fact, he, he proposes that we speak of it as designoid, as the term for biological entities. Don't say they're designed, say they're designoid. And PZ has said something along those lines too in the past. And I beg to differ. <laughs> I think we do want to say, this is design, it's not apparent design. What we have to do is to convince people that there can be design without a designer. Well, isn't that a contradiction in terms? No more than splittable atom is a contradiction in terms. The term <laughs> atom means you can't split it. But we learned you can. We kept the term and just gave up the idea that by definition an atom was unsplittable. Similarly, keep the term design and give up the presumption, very nicely characterized by Shelley, that you can't have design without an intelligent designer. Now I'll tell you a bit more about why I beg to differ, but I want to, first of all, drive, try to drive home the point that evolved design is real design, not apparent design. I'll tell you what apparent design is, and there's a lot of it around, and you recognize it, and it just looks like design, and it's, it's very familiar from, you know, cheesy cartoons. Here, here's, here's a chemistry lab. Yeah, whoa, complicated, wow, design. But you know, it's just playing at design. It isn't real design. Or, you know, the scientist blackboard all covered with fancy, inscrutable formula, and scientists saying something. That's not real design, that's just a, that's designoid. Or this, this is a cyclotron back in the early days of cyclotron. I just, pick those up off the web. So we know what apparent design is. It's stuff that looks cool, but doesn't do anything. Couldn't do anything, isn't actually designed. And the difference is, evolved design isn't apparent design. It really does stuff. And it does it excellently. That's why we shouldn't call it apparent design. We should call it design. You can reverse engineer it. You can prove how good it is at doing the things it does just as you can with artifacts. Now, but why should we, why do I disagree with Dawkins about this? I'm gonna tell you a little story. This is why I showed you the video, the animation at the beginning. I was in a bar, I can't imagine why I was there, but I was, <laughs> and I overheard some people talking, and I think they had just seen that video, or they had seen something like it. 
And they were marveling at the intricacy and at the design. And one of them said, uh, boy, how could you believe in evolution after seeing that? And nobody disagreed. Nobody disagreed. Now, were those rednecks? No. They were Harvard medical students. Somehow they had got it in their head that evolutionary biologists are reluctant to acknowledge the intricacy, the complexity, the efficiency of design of living things. That it was somehow to their rhetorical purpose to say, oh, it's not really so wonderful, it's not really so wonderfully designed. Whereas in fact, evolutionary biologists should be having just as much awe at the stupendously good design in nature, but also, of course, including the, the famous and wonderful cases of, of, of uh, evolution's short-sighted kludginess when it does these things. But when evolution is kludgy, it's brilliantly kludgy. All this without a smidgen of intelligence. Okay, I've said this already. Design without a designer is like splittable atoms. Which would you, just think of this strategically. Would you rather try to convince people that they don't see the design they think they see when they look at the living world? Or that of course they see the design they think they see, but they don't need to have an intelligent designer to produce that design. I say the second is a more plausible expository strategy than the former. So what I'm saying is that natural selection is an automatic reason finder which discovers, endorses, and focuses reasons over many generations. Now you may notice that I had a lot of scare quotes in that. I'm now going to cash those scare quotes out. So there's nothing controversial about this. Consider a population of some species with a lot of variation in it. And over the course of a generation, some do well, some don't. That is, some have more offspring than others. In each case, we can ask, why? In many cases, the answer is no reason at all, just dumb luck or dumb bad luck. No reason at all. But suppose there's a subset, and it might be very small, of cases where there is an answer to the why question. There is a feature that they share, a difference that makes a difference that explains why they do better than the others. Now that's a how come explanation, but, it's, but it is also the birth of a what for account. What those cases have in common provides the germ of a reason. And then natural selection tracks reasons, creating things that have purposes, but don't need to know them. Very important, you can have purposes that you don't know or understand. The need to know principle, made famous in spycraft, only tell your agents what they need to, absolutely need to know. That way if they get caught and waterboarded and they spill the beans, they only have a few beans to spill. In evolution, the rationale for the need to know principle is entirely different. It's just sheer stinginess. Too expensive? Don't have it and it rains in the biosphere, natural selection itself doesn't need to know what it's doing. And this is the great insight that Darwin had. My favorite quote about Darwin comes from Robert Beverly Mackenzie, writing in 1868, and I just do have to read it, because I think it's so rhetorically wonderful. In the theory with which we have to deal, Absolute ignorance is the artificer, so that we may enunciate as the fundamental principle of the whole system that in order to make a perfect and beautiful machine, it is not requisite to know how to make it. 
This proposition will be found on careful examination to express in condensed form the essential purport of the theory and to express in a few words all Mr. Darwin's meaning, who by a strange inversion of reasoning seems to think absolute wisdom fully qualified to take the place, absolute ignorance fully qualified to take the place of absolute wisdom in all the achievements of creative skill. Bingo, he's got it. That's exactly right. That is what Darwin is showing, and it is a strange inversion of reasoning. It means abandoning an idea that is just seems at first so obvious. It takes a big fancy smart thing to make a lesser thing. We never see a pot making a potter, we never see a horseshoe making a blacksmith. All is the other way around stands to reason. And the creationists love to hammer on about this. And what we have to say to them is, I know, isn't it amazing? Isn't it strange to think that we can invert that and show, no, it's just not true. There is another way for designs to come into existence, a way which does start with absolute ignorance, no purpose, no mind, and yet generates all this wonderful stuff. Now, Alan Turing has his own strange inversion of reasoning, and it's very similar. In fact, they together make a wonderful team. Here's a photograph of some pre-Turing computers. They're wearing dresses. Computers were people. A lot of them were women. They tended to be math majors. And they were employed by the thousands before there were any other kind of computers. And, and that's, what, what are you? I'm a computer. It was a, job, it was a job that you had. In the old days, computers had to understand arithmetic. It was a technical job. They had to appreciate the reasons. Turing recognized that this was not necessary. Now we can see this if we compare Mackenzie's capital letter outrage uh, summary of Darwin with, with a similar thing we could say about Turing. So here's Darwin. In order to make a perfect and beautiful machine, it's not requisite to know how to make it. Here's Turing. In order to be a perfect and beautiful computing machine, it is not requisite to know what arithmetic is. What an amazing idea. What a strange inversion of reasoning. And what both of them together show is an amazing fact that there can be, this is my new bumper sticker, <laughs> competence without comprehension. And it really is a strange idea. I mean, why do you go to university? Your parents, they say, we want you to understand so that you can be competent. And indeed, comprehension is the royal road to competence in many regards. But it's not the only road. And that's what Darwin and Turing in their different and complementary ways realized. That you can turn it around and you can have competence without comprehension. And then mind, consciousness, intention turns out to be the effect, not the cause we get a complete inversion of the standard order of these things. In order to do this, in both Darwinism and computer science, we need what I now call the sorta operator. The CPU, central processing unit, sorta understands add and subtract. That is to say, when it gets the add instruction, it adds. When it gets the subtract instruction, it subtracts. That's all there is to it. The operating system sorta understands where where to file away the work in progress when you switch tasks. The search engines sort of knows the difference between SALT and the SALT treaty. The airline reservation system sort of understands when you say you want to fly to Chicago and so forth. And it is Turing's dream that you can build enough of this sort of understanding into real comprehension, bit by bit, by just adding competences. But you have to start with competences that have no comprehension at all. Okay. Now we're ready to look at the top of this ladder. Sorry, I have to, I have to use that otherwise unfortunate uh, metaphor. We're the ones 
that represent reasons. You'll notice that the guy, he says why, he says why twice. The dog never asks why. This is a brilliant construction. It's a food sieve made by a caddis larva. The water flows in at the top, goes down through, and there's a mesh, a screen, that catches the food as the water flows through, and the larva can get to either side of the screen through that extra tunnel which goes around the side. You can see it better in the top view. Brilliant bit of engineering. That's a caddis fly larva. Oh, here's another artifact with a very similar purpose. It's for getting food out of water by sieving it in a certain way. What's the difference between them? Well, there are reasons for the arrangement of parts in the lobster trap. But there's also reasons for the caddis larva's food sieve. Yes, there are reasons why the parts are the way they are. But the caddis reasons are not represented anywhere. Not in the caddis fly's tiny brain and not anywhere else. Not until some biologist comes along and figures out why this is the right way. That's the first time those reasons are ever represented. On the left, you see a termite castle. On the right, you see Gaudi's La Sagrada Familia, famous church in Barcelona. They are stunningly similar in shape and actually even in architecture in many other ways. But they are designed and built by two profoundly different processes. The one on the left is built by termites and they are basically clueless. There's no architect termite, there's no leader termite, there's no blueprints, there's no designs. They're each following a little bunch of local rules and this amazing structure emerges. Gaudi, on the other hand, is just paradigmatic, brilliant, genius, dictatorial builder, designer. He had the blueprints, the manifestos, the reasons. He had it all worked out and he ordered his underlings around who ordered their underlings around and so forth. So you have on the, in the, in the case of the Barcelona church, that's top-down intelligent design. In the case of the termite hill, this is bottom-up designed by clueless agents. Now there's a reason why the termite does what it does. But don't say that the termite has the reason. The termite can't understand the reason, doesn't need to, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't dwell on it, doesn't follow it even. But there is a reason. Gaudi, in contrast, had reasons. You can read his diaries. You can find out what the reasons were. He had it all worked out. Profoundly different. There's reasons in both cases, but in only one case are they represented. Human beings have reasons. Here's a question. Do other animals have reasons? Well, they do things for reasons, but that's not the same as having a reason for doing those things. I call these reasons that are not had or represented by any organism or agent, I call them free-floating rationales, a term which inspires dread and heebie-jeebies in a lot of my biology friends. They don't like this term, as if I were saying something mystical. No, free-floating rationales, unrepresented reasons, are no more mysterious than numbers. <laughs> Did human beings create numbers? No, we created numerals, names for numbers. There were, there were prime numbers before there were representations of prime numbers. And there were reasons before there were representations of reasons. Trees do things for reasons. Fungi do things for reasons. Bacteria do things for reasons. The biotic world is saturated with reasons from the molecular scale on up. We do things. We shiver, we vomit, we blink for reasons we don't need to know. There's lots and lots of reasons out there, folks, because we're designed. For years, one of my favorite cases, the cuckoo chick. 
Cuckoos are brood parasites. They don't make their own nests. The female cuckoo, before she lays her eggs, she finds a host pair that have built a nest and laid, and laid the eggs in that. She waits for the pair to go off feeding. She surreptitiously swoops down, lays her egg in their nest, and rolls one of the eggs out of the nest. That's just in case the host species can count. <laughs> when, the, when the cuckoo chick is born, the first thing it does, oh, by the way, it tends to have a shorter incubation period than the host, so it fat hatches first. First thing it does, it tries to roll the other eggs out of the nest, and there's a reason for that. It's pretty obvious. But the little cuckoo doesn't have to understand that. It knows not what it does. <laughs> it doesn't have to know. There's a reason for what it does, but it's clueless. There's a reason why the cuckoo rolls out an egg when she lays her own. There's a reason why the chick pushes out the eggs when it hatches. There's a reason why trees spread their branches. But they don't have to be appreciated by the beneficiaries. They need not be reason representers. Only we, only we are reason representers. Now here's a tough question. Is an ape more like a termite colony or Gaudi? And it is not clear. It is not clear. Apes do lots of things for reasons in the same way termites do lots of things for reasons, without having a clue about them. Do they also have clues about some of the things they do? Well, it seems probably they do, but it isn't as clear as you might think. As usual with evolution, there are a lot of gradual intermediate cases. Ruth Millikan talks about animals that represent their goals in the same representational system in which they represent their facts. But then when you understand what a representation means in this context, you realize you can't just point and say, see, that's where this representation of goals is happening. It's not that clear. My friend, colleague Nick Humphrey says that apes are natural psychologists. But they differ from academic psychologists in one really important way, and they never compare notes. <laughs> and that's huge. I'm going to pass over some issues. That this I want to move on, so I'm just going to pass over the theory of mind debates and the way culture helps our minds. I'm going to leave that, makes our, the way culture makes our minds unlike eight minds. Those are favorite topics of mine, but not for today. I'm already running over time, probably. Here's a nice diagram of the Great Tree of Life. This is Leonard Eisenberg's. You can get it on his website. What's nice about it is that it shows the present along the arc, the outer arc, and we see the birth of life down there on the lower left in the center. For about a billion years, there were just single-celled prokaryotes. And then we had the eukaryotic revolution. All the colored things we see uh, fanning out above, those are all eukaryotes, more complex cells. And our branch, where we split from the chimpanzee, is, would be sort of too small to be seen on this diagram. We're just little, little tiny twig over to the far right there. Uh, that's where we are. Now, what I'm saying is we, we human beings, that one species on the planet, we're the first reason representers in the tree of life so far. Which means that our natural tendency to interpret all design as top-down, Gaudi-type intelligent design, as representation-driven, is both anachronistic and anthropomorphic. Seems I've heard this somewhere before. In the beginning was the word. Book of John, I do believe. No. No. Words are actually a very recent invention. <laughs> They've only been around for a few thousand years. They're one of the most recent products of blind, purposeless, natural selection. But they are the beginning of intelligent design. Without words, no Gaudi. 
We are the first intelligent designers on the planet. We, the reason representers, can now look back and discover the reasons everywhere in the tree of life. It took Darwin to figure out that a mindless process could discover all those reasons. We intelligent designers are among the effects, not the cause, of all those purposes. Okay, we get now to the final section and I will perhaps speed up. One of my favorite philosophers, the late philosopher Wilfred Sellers, uh, made a distinction between what he called the manifest and scientific images. I think this is one of the most useful uh, philosophical distinctions I know. The manifest image, that's the world we live in. It's the world of colors and solid objects and opportunities, or as Gibson would say, affordances of all kinds. And that's where we find sweet and sexy and cute and funny. All these very important properties, it's where we find free will, other minds, um, everyday causation, and reasons. This is the world we grow up in before we ever learn any science at all. And reasons are right there in the manifest image. We're the reason representers. Now, back to Pittsburgh normativity. Robert Brandom is reticent about why we represent reasons. Remember in the game of reason giving and so forth? He says we just do, it's just who we are, it's what, it's what people do. This will not do. This is an elaborate, designed, expensive practice of ours, and it's got to be there. There's got to be an answer to the question of why we do it. Here's my answer. We do it because this is an outgrowth of something I call the intentional stance, which is itself an instinct. It's something that's partly encoded in our genomes. And it's an instinct that we share with other animals, with mammals, with birds, maybe with, even with fish, certainly with cephalopods, <laughs> um, like octopuses. And what it is is whenever anything complicated and even a little bit surprising happens, we immediately, instinctively, we say, who's there? Who, not what? And what do you want? It's this treating complexity as an agent with beliefs and desires, that's the intentional stance, and it's built right in, it is a, it is a reflex in us. But in us, unlike in your dog, who can't talk about it, language renders this all visible, and purposes and reasons and beliefs and desires become objects to consider, to investigate, to justify, to evaluate, in just the way that Brandon and the people in Pittsburgh say. This is something that only our species does. But now, we, here's a curious historical, now and here's a little how come explanation. In the beginning, when we, before we had science, we had paleo science, we had before science, and initially we treated all complicated, interesting things from the intentional stance. Rivers wanted to return to the sea, rain gods might be bribed, the lodestone had a soul, and so forth. Now, from our Olympian perch today, we can retrospect this was an overextension. Those weren't really agents. This was a good trick, the intentional stance overused. But now what's happened is that the, we've, had, we've gone through this period of the de-animization of the world by science, and I'm saying that science overshot in the opposite direction. Thou shalt not speak teleology is a is a maxim that a lot of scientists think they've learned. Thou shalt not endow material things with minds. Skinner is famous for this. And Sidney Morgenbesser once famously said to him in typical Morgenbesser incredulity, you telling me it's wrong to anthropomorphize people? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's pretty much what Skinner was saying. But we can anthropomorphize people and we can anthropomorphize a lot more. Back to Marx. Not only is the death blow dealt here for the first time to teleology and the natural sciences, but their rational meaning is empirically explained. I think it's the second half that's right. The rational meaning of teleology is empirically explained by Darwin. If you understand intentional stance talk in the evolutionist's way, you can, you can see the woods for the trees. 
You can't do biology without assuming function, and you can't assume function without seeing reasons everywhere. Now, some philosophers of biology are uncomfortable with this. I just want to alert you. I'm saying something a little bit controversial. Peter Godfrey Smith, one of my favorites, calls this Darwinian paranoia. <laughs> Alex Rosenberg calls it a conspiracy theory. And I call it an indispensable good trick. So now, I've described two different senses of why, what for and how come, and I've showed how Darwin shows us in, in sketch how to get from how come to what for, how we're the only reason representers, and how we can use the intentional stance and represent reasons even in the scientific image. Because reasons are real patterns in the world. Some of you can see my little Darwin pin. The, uh, I was wearing this at a meeting, and the physicist Murray Gell-Mann, who knows everything, came up to me and said, Dan, uh, I like your Darwin pin, but you realize, of course, that that's a, a play on the Christian fish symbol. Yeah, of course. But that's the first acronym. Ichthus the Greek word for fish, from which we get ichthyology, of course, stands for Jesus Christos Theon Ios Soter, Jesus Christ, God, Son, and Savior. That's why the early Christians used the fish, because of this acronym. I said, yeah, I've heard that, Murray, that's nice. He said, what I want to know is, what does D-A-R-W-I-N stand for? Well, I didn't have the Greek, really, but I said, well, give, me a, give me a half hour, I'm going to dredge up my high school Latin and see what I can come up with. So I tried. And of course, there's no W in Latin. But there is U, so there's double U. <laughs> D-A-R-W-I-N. So here, I am telling you, is what D-A-R-W-I-N stands for. Delere auctorum rerum. Ut universum infinitum noscas. Do we have a classicist in the audience that would like to translate that? Right over here. Yes? Destroy the author of things in order to know the, the infinite universe. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Destroy, destroy the author of things in order to understand or know the infinite universe. Thanks very much for your attention.